Now these next two results are applications of the mean value theorem where we're going to show that if the derivative of a function has a certain property, then that tells us something about the function itself. Now it'll turn out that these results are useful when we get to calculus 2, but we're not going to worry about that just yet. So what is the first result? Well, let's back up a little bit. If we have a function who, which is constant, then its derivative is 0. Can we say something about the opposite direction? What if we know the function's derivative is 0? Can we therefore conclude that the function is constant? And this result tells us that, yes, we can under certain conditions. So suppose the derivative of the function f is 0 for all x in an interval a, b. So the derivative is 0 everywhere in an interval. Then the function has to be constant on that interval. Let's go ahead and prove this. So we're going to suppose, this is our hypothesis, suppose f prime of x is 0 for all x in the interval a, b. How do I show the function's constant? Well, to show a function's constant, all I really need to show is that the function values at any two inputs from that interval have to be the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus my attention. So let x1 and x2 be any values in the interval a, b. What can we conclude then about these values? I'm going to use x1 and x2 as the endpoints for my interval, which I apply the mean value theorem to. So what can we conclude? Well, we have that f is continuous on x1, x2. Okay, some of these may take a bit of thought. Why is f continuous on this interval? Well, I know that f, the derivative of f, is 0 for all x and a, b. So in particular, I know that f is differentiable on the open interval a, b. I pick two elements, x1 and x2. I'm assuming that x1 is smaller than x2. That's why I'm writing in x1, 2, x2. So I pick two values in the interval. Then I know that f has to be differentiable at both those values and also all values in between because these all lie in the interval a, b, and f is differentiable on the entire open interval a, b. So I know that f is, maybe I should have written this one down first just because it's the easy one to see, f is differentiable on it's actually differentiable on the closed interval, but we can keep it as the open interval. It's differentiable on the open interval. In fact, it's differentiable on the closed interval because x1 and x2 are in a, b. If it's differentiable on that interval, then it has to be continuous on it as well. Because if a function is differentiable, then it's continuous. You get that for free. So it's both continuous and differentiable. And so by the mean value theorem, by the mean value theorem, there is a c in the interval x1 to x2 such that f of x2 minus f of x1 is equal to f prime of c times x2 minus x1. Notice I've just used that second equation in the statement of the mean value theorem. Let's back up to it. I'm just using this one here where I've just re rewritten it, where I've cleared the denominators. So there has to be a place, c, in the interval x1 to x2, where the difference of f of x2 and f of x1 is equal to the derivative times the difference of x2 and x1. But here's the interesting part. We know that the derivative for every value in the interval a to b is 0 c is in the interval x1 to x2, but x1 and x2 are in the interval a to b, so their interval between them is a subinterval of a, b. So what do I know? I know that this has to be 0. That's my hypothesis. So what that means is that f of x2 minus f of x1 is 0, or in other words, f of x1 and f of x2 have the same value. Now I know that the f has to be constant. Why is that? Well, I picked any x1 and x2 in the interval. Any x1 and x2 in the interval a, b. 
and I show they have to have the same value. The function has the same value at them. And so the function has to have the same value at all points in that interval. So therefore, f is constant. And that's the end of our proof. So from the mean value theorem, we've got this result that says if I know a function is, has a derivative of 0 on an interval, then it had to be a constant function on that interval. Now, let's look at a more general statement. Suppose I have that two functions, f and g, have the property that their derivatives are equal to each other on an interval. Then, what can I conclude? Well, I can conclude that the functions had to differ by a constant. In other words, f has to be the function g plus some constant. How do we prove this? Well, this is actually quite easy to prove because we have this result above that we already proved. So what we apply, what we do is we apply above result to this function h, which is f of x minus g of x. What do I mean by apply the above result to h? Well, I mean, look at the function h. What's its derivative? Well, the derivative would be f prime minus g prime. But I know f and g prime are the same, so f prime minus g prime would be 0. So in other words, h prime is 0 on the entire interval. Oh, if h prime is 0 on the interval, the above result tells me that h had to be constant. So if h is constant, it means the difference of f and g is constant. Or in other words, f is g plus a constant. So there's our, our proof of that. And this is the result that gets used in integral calculus all the time. Because in integral calculus, what you do is the opposite. You start with a function, and you work out an antiderivative, a function whose derivative is the one you start with. And this result tells us that, well, if I start with a function and I work out an antiderivative, I can get any antiderivative by just adding an arbitrary constant to it. So that's where this result's coming into play when we get into calculus 2. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can apply this result to another example. So here's an interesting way to prove identities. So I want to prove this trigonometric identity, that arc sine of x minus 1 over x plus 1 is equal to twice arc tangent of root x minus pi by 2. How do we prove this trig identity? Well, we're given a bit of a hint because it's following this fact. This fact says that if f and g have the same derivative, then they have to differ up to a constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this be f and this be g. And now I'm going to work out the derivatives. What is f prime of x? So the derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus the inside squared times the derivative of the inside. So it's x minus 1 over x plus 1. So let's finish off our derivative and then maybe do a little bit of simplification here. So it's 1 minus x minus 1 all over x plus 1 squared. And the derivative of this, that's a quotient, so we'll use the quotient rule. So it's the derivative of the top, which is 1, times the bottom, minus the top, times the derivative of the bottom, all over the bottom squared. So now I go to work on what's inside the square root, and I get square root of this x plus 1 squared, so x plus 1 all squared, make that my common denominator, that's minus x minus 1 all squared, all over x plus 1 all squared, times x minus x, they go away, 1 minus minus 1, so that's a 2, so I can put the 2 up top here, and then I get a 1 over x plus 1 all squared. Okay, and now I can expand these things out, I get an and I get an x squared plus 2x plus 1 minus an x squared minus 2x plus 1. And all of that is over, well, all of that is over the x plus 1 all squared, but I can bring that outside of the square root. 
as a 1 over x plus 1, but I have an x plus 1 squared, so I would get some cancellations there. And so I'm just left with an x plus 1 like that. Now I get an x squared cancelling, I get a 1 cancelling, and then I have a 2x minus a minus 2x, so that's a 4x. Oh, but it's under a square root, so square root of 4 would be 2, the 2 would cancel with the 1 on top, and all this then simplifies down to just a 1 over root x. And then we have an x plus 1 on the denominator. So what looked to be fairly messy to begin with simplified down quite nicely. Now we look at the derivative of the other piece, the arctan. So the derivative of the arctan, well, there's a 2 out front. The derivative of the arctan is 1 over 1 plus the inside squared times the derivative of the inside. The 2's cancel off. We get a 1 over root x and also a 1 plus x on the bottom. Ah, and we notice that these are the same. So what does that mean? Well, it means then f of x is equal to g of x plus a constant. That's what that result above said. We have the fact that f and g have the same derivative. So they have to differ by a constant. So f is equal to g plus a constant. What is the constant? Well, we want to show it's negative pi by 2. So let's check. So now plug in x equals something. I'm going to plug x equals something into the expression so that I can easily work out the arc sine and the tangent, arc tangent, and get the value of c. So what's easy to work out? Well, 0 looks quite nice. So if I plug in 0, what's f of 0? Well, f is arc sine of 0 minus 1 over 0 plus 1. Arc sine of negative 1. Arc sine of negative 1. So what's the angle for which the sine of it is negative 1? Well, that would be negative pi by 2. What is g of 0? Well, that would be twice arctan of 0 and that has a value of 0. So what we have is that our equation f of 0 equals g of 0 plus c means that negative pi by 2 is equal to 0 plus c or c is equal to negative pi by 2. So we know that f is equal to g plus c and we know that c is negative pi by 2 and that's what we were asked to establish. That was the identity we wanted. So here we saw that we can use the mean value theorem in a somewhat interesting and perhaps surprising way. We we're able to show a relationship between two functions and in fact therefore prove an identity. Alright, well that's it for this section. Thanks very much for watching and we will see you again next time.